So before coming to Kingswood, I uh, was a regional pastor or a district superintendent along with several other clergy, and uh, along with the bishop, we met about once or twice a month for two or three day stints. So I just want you to imagine a church committee meeting that lasts two or three days. Sounds great fun, amen, right? The one thing that made it kind of wonderful is that we had to, we had to stay the night because we, some of us traveled from far away. And so after a while, we began to find ourselves meeting regularly at the Loretto Center in Wheaton. The Loretto Center was the Sisters of the Blessed Virgin Mary, a Catholic retreat center, and they war- welcomed us warmly. Their food was wonderful. The space was great. And we gathered there for a number of years. Of course, every morning when we gathered for worship, we would sing, and the sisters would always give thanks for those Methodists because they seemed to know how to sing. And so we would sing our hymns, and some would drop by and join us, and it was just a wonderful relationship. And you know how this goes. As you spend more time meeting there, you develop a deeper relationship. So one Advent season, uh, one of the sisters came to us and said, would you join us and sit with us at lunch and have lunch with us, and we have a carol sing together. And so we said, sure, we'd love to do that. And so uh, this big snowy day came. Uh, We barely all got there, and we gathered for lunch. And uh, as we were gathering for lunch, we realized that one among us was having a birthday, and we'd forgotten it, and the sisters didn't have a cake. So I ran to the Jewel at Donata Square, and I picked up this uh, cake quickly and grabbed the candles and raced back, and we continued to sing carols, and we had this lovely lunch, and we sang Silent Night as the last song. It was beautiful. It was a wonderful time. It was a sign of all of us deeply connected as followers of Jesus. And so as the sisters began to make their way to their meetings and their worship and other things that they had for the day, we decided to have this birthday party in the lunchroom. So we brought out the cake, and our colleague Lonnie was thrilled that we'd remembered. We really hadn't, but last minute we had. We put on the candles. We wished him happy birthday, We lit the candles, and he blew them out. But they suddenly relit immediately. In fact, not only did they relight, but they were candles that would shoot sparks and smoke as they relit. I didn't know that in my hurry I had grabbed the wrong candles, and these were trick, sparkling, smoking, out-of-control birthday candles. Well, we were filled with joy, right? So we just laughed, and Lonnie laughed, and he blew them out again. And, of course, they restarted and shot some smoke and threw off some, and we just kept doing it. It was one of those moments, if you've ever remember as a child, where you know you need to stop, but you just can't make yourself stop. We finally stopped when the fire alarm went off, right? This very loud, and, and, and. You've probably been there before. And so we quickly ran out into the halls and said, it's our fault, and we're sorry, and let's just cut the thing off. And one of the sisters said, the Wheaton Fire Department will not allow that. We all have to be evacuated outside. Oh, I know. It gets worse. (laughs) We finally got the candles extinguished. Smoke is rolling everywhere. The fire alarm is going off, and suddenly we see all of the sisters, much in later age, making themselves in their way into the snow. I remember standing outside in the snow and hearing two sisters speak to one another, one saying, how did this happen? Who did this? And the other sister said, it's the Methodists. (laughs) They can sing, but they can't handle their candles. It was not a great moment of bridging the gap of religious difference, amen? Luckily, the sisters came back in. (laughs) After the fire department showed up, we were all kind of cold and frazzled, and I will say to you that never again did we, were we allowed to light a real candle. In fact, the next week that we were there, the sisters presented us with some beautiful LED candles, which we used from then forward. <laughs> Isn't that how it goes, right? It's going to be this holy, sacred moment. We've just sung Silent Night. We're going to celebrate a birthday, and something falls apart. It's loud, it's noisy, there's smoke, it's out of control. Maybe it sounds like your holiday meal today. I don't know, right? Things didn't quite go like you thought they were going to go. And the silence of the sacred is busted wide open by the realities of the world. All these past four weeks of Advent, we've been talking about Silent Night, this beautiful hymn written uh, in Germany for a small church and sung and later set to music and is now 
a song we always sing on Christmas Eve, right? And when we sing it and light the candles, it's a beautiful moment. But the reality is the first Christmas was not all a silent night. In fact, it was hardly a silent night at all. You see, Mary and Joseph were engaged to be married. And then Mary had a visit from an angel and suddenly showed up and said to Joseph she was pregnant. And immediately their relationship was in trouble. Not a silent night. Joseph had decided that he would leave her quietly, though she could have been punished severely. But because of his deep love for her, he decides to disappear quietly. An angel appears to Joseph and says to not be afraid. And and in the end, tells Joseph that he needs to remain with Mary and name this child Jesus. And so he does. And I imagine that their relationship and their engagement and all the bridal showers were not filled with great joy. I'm sure Mary's family was deeply embarrassed. Joseph's family thought he had lost his mind. It doesn't sound like the perfect relationship. Amen? And then in the reading today, we hear that in the midst of being pregnant and almost ready to give birth, and in the midst of all of the challenges of a young girl who has under suspicion in her own hometown of Nazareth, with Pastor Josh told us today is kind of a a no-man's land. It's a not well-known village. In fact, in first century maps, it didn't appear. It's, it's kind of like maybe, um, I don't know, let's say Round Lake or something, okay? You know what I'm saying? It's just a place that no one goes, right? And yet it's in this town that maybe Mary and Joseph hope to make some semblance of their life together and to move on, and suddenly there's a new tax plan, okay? And the new tax plan requires them to travel. They're not even able to register for their new tax in the census in their own town, but they have to travel. They have to travel to the hometown of their ancestors. And Joseph is from the line of David, and David's hometown, as you well know, is Bethlehem, the city of David. It's 90 miles. And sometimes I often wonder, why didn't Mary stay with her family? Why did she have to travel with Joseph? Maybe they just were so connected after all they'd been through that they traveled My bet is Joseph wasn't for sure she would be safe in that town. Maybe Mary's family didn't really want her to remain, and maybe there was a lot of suspicion. But whatever the reason, Joseph convinces Mary in this fullness of pregnancy to travel. So we think of 90 miles as a quick trip to Madison and back, right? But when you're pregnant and you're walking, we're not sure they had a donkey. There's no mention of it. It's several days, maybe 10 days. And I imagine, though we don't know for sure, that they arrived late at night, and we're told that probably uh, there was no room in the inn. That's what we often hear. The translation probably is more truthfully, there was no room in the guest room. I assume that Joseph had relatives there, right? It was his hometown. And maybe he went to his you know, Aunt Miriam or Uncle Joe uh, you know, or whoever and said, can we stay here tonight? And they say, there's no room. Maybe there was no room because there really was no room because people had to go and register for the census, and maybe all the relatives were in town, and Mary and Joseph got there late. Uh, Maybe there was a little suspicion or something hanging over their heads, and nobody really wanted to house them. And maybe there wasn't room in the inn at all. Who knows? But there wasn't any room. So we don't know the whole story, but what we do know from Scripture is they find themselves in a stable. could be a cave out behind the house. Some folks kept their animals, if they didn't have a lot of money, in the bottom room of their home, kind of like a shelter or a carport, to keep them out of the dangers of of the night. And it's there that Mary and Joseph find themselves, in a barn. It's an amazing story because there we're told that Mary gives birth and they wrap the baby in tight clothes, which would have cloths of uh, bands of cloths. The old beautiful world was swaddling clothes. They're bands of cloth, folks, right? was to keep him straight and warm, and it was an ancient way that babies were cared for. And then we expect that maybe he'll be laid in a crib or a a wonderful bed or at least a beautiful sheet or blanket, but he's laid in a feeding trough. We say manger, and we feel good about that, but this is a sign of deep poverty. Amen? For Mary was a peasant, and Joseph didn't have much money, and we know from later parts of this story they had very little resources, and here they are on the night. I find it interesting that the night's not so silent. For those of you in the room who have given birth, you know it isn't silent. Amen? Hello out there? Any witnesses? Right? It's messy. It's loud. You want to kill somebody maybe, right? 
That's what we're talking about, friends. It's not such a silent night. And then in the midst of all of that, with animals around you and straw in a place for your baby in the feeding trough and a night you never imagined that God's Son would come into, the angels suddenly appear. Not at, not at the stable. We always have them up around, but they, they don't appear there. They appear in the fields to the shepherds. And we all know about shepherds, don't we? Amen? Right? In the Old Testament, shepherds were lifted up like King David and and, and the Messiah was to be the shepherd of shepherds. But in the New Testament era, in, in the time of Jesus, shepherds were the lowest of low. Think about it. They handled sheep. They slept in the fields with sheep. They took care of sheep. They cleaned up after sheep. Are you getting my picture? Right, you know? So according to Levitical law, they probably weren't even clean, ritually clean. So they probably hadn't been to the temple, let alone a synagogue, in a long time. And here on the outskirts or in the fields of Bethlehem, there they are. Suddenly, some angels appear to them, uh, the heavenly hosts, brilliant and amazing, and they say to the shepherds, do not be afraid. Isn't that what they always say, just like Josh said today? If angels appear to you, your life is going to change, right? And then to say, do not be afraid, come on. So that's not much of a silent night, is it? Let me think about it. Tonight, if you go home and you're about to unravel gifts, uh, unwrap gifts, and an angel suddenly appears, and your room's full of brilliant light, and this voice from nowhere says, do not be afraid, that's going to be hard for me, okay, right? Okay, it's going to be hard. The shepherds try to hold themselves together as they hear that, in fact, the Messiah has been born in the city of David, and then the angels give a clue that when you go to Bethlehem, you will find the glorious King of Kings, the Son of God, in a barn and you will find him laying in a feeding trough and he will be wrapped in bands of cloth now i don't know about you but that's not how i've experienced royalty amen that's not how i experience people of power entering the world it already says to us something about this messiah this christ this jesus and who he is and was and will be in our lives. It's not such a silent night. And so the shepherds follow the angels' instructions, and I don't think we realize what great cost they gave. They left their flocks in the fields. It's very dangerous. And they traveled all the way to Bethlehem, and indeed, as they came into the city of Bethlehem, they found Mary and Joseph and the baby in a barn. And the baby was wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a feeding trough, and they were rejoicing. And so they told Mary and Joseph all the things that they had been told and the, uh, the, the angel story, and it was a glorious moment. And maybe in that moment, just in that moment, there was a sense of joy, but I'm sure animals made noises, babies cry, Mary's exhausted, shepherds smell, and in the midst of that, that's the reality in which God came into the world. It's not such a silent night. And in many ways, that's a beautiful word for us, that God sends his son in the midst of the brokenness of the world and the brokenness of our lives, that sometimes we have to be reminded that God comes through the unexpected and chooses the unexpected, that God doesn't come through the mighty and the powerful and the prestigious and the beautiful and, you know, the the well-versed and all that, but God comes in the simplicity of people and lives and experiences and brokenness and noise and animals and barns and stables and speaks deeply into our lives that the world must and should be and has to be a different place. Amen? Two weeks ago, we had our uh, Christmas pageant. The puppets performed. We had a wonderful carol sing. Uh, we had uh, a beautiful time of various performances. Some of you were there. It was a beautiful night. It, had its, it has what Christmas pageants often do, kind of a mixed bag of things. Uh, and then we eventually have the living nativity, and the kids come down the center aisle. Some of you have been here many times for that, and there's a manger here, and Mary and Joseph come and stand, and, and then there's a couple of uh, shepherds, and then more shepherds, and there's an angel or two, and then we have a lot of sheep and a lot of angels, right? And they flock in here. And they gather around the baby Jesus, and we've learned from experience it's not a real baby, right? In fact, two years ago, the shepherds got into a huge straw fight, and Jesus was getting pushed way down, right? 
And so that's when you go, good decision, James. Good decision, right? So this year, like every year, I expected something to happen, and it was a little chaotic, and Mary and Joseph were a little tight and upset about something, and the, the angels were too stiff, and the shepherds were wandering around, and one was jumping, trying to be seen, and some of you remember that. And I laughed and thought, oh, well, not a silent night, but this is how it is. And I was thinking, i got to get home, and there's lots to do, and i got to catch up on episodes of This Is Us, and you know what I'm saying, right? And then all of a sudden, the kings come in. And I know these kings. You know these kings. They were full of energy. Why, wow, they traveled faster than any kings ever had from the east, right? And those three kings knelt at these steps. If you were here, you remember. And I thought, well, I'm sitting right there where Teal and Carrie Ann are. And I thought, it's just a beautiful pageant. And uh, I'll be on my way. And one of the kings starts worshiping Jesus. And he begins to fall down more deeply. And at first, I think he's cutting up. And he probably was. But then he wasn't. And he laid down really low before Jesus. And then it was a silent night. And then it was a holy night. And then there were radiant beams from heaven afar. And in that moment, I was more grateful for Jesus than ever before. So it's not always silent. Amen? And our lives are broken sometimes. Amen? And the world is certainly broken. Amen. But in a manger, in a barn, in a family with very little, through the least expected, God speaks deeply. My light will forever shine. As we heard early in the service, the center candle, the white candle, is the Christ candle. And on Christmas Eve night, we light this candle as a sign that Christ is born, and we celebrate his birth, but we celebrate even more deeply that the light of Christ, as the Gospel of John reminds us, will never be extinguished. In fact, the darkness cannot overcome it. And so tonight, as people of God, as followers of Jesus on this most holy of nights, we share the light of Christ from this candle. I invite you to stand as you're able. 